Chapter 11. The Mormon Battalion Dilemma. Senator Thomas H. Benton. Dot, 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 obtained the requisition to call for that battalion, and, in case of non compliance, dot, 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 to destroy the camp of Israel. This same Mr. Benton said to the President of the United States, dot, 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 Sir, they are a pestilential race and ought to become extinct. Brigham Young, J.D. 10 106 107. The politicians in Washington wanted to destroy the Mormons because they feared the loss of their own political power. They saw Joseph Smith as their greatest danger, because like the Jews, they thought he would cause them to lose their place and nation. See John 11:48. Since the death of Joseph Smith didn't break up the Mormons or their religion, the opposition sought for another plan. A diabolical scheme was instigated by Senator Thomas Benton of Missouri which authorized a government order for the formation of a Mormon battalion. The Mormon people had been persecuted by mobs and ministers from state to state. Then they were driven out of the United States into hostile Indian territory. In addition to a shortage of food and supplies, and frequent bad weather, they were now to be burdened with one more problem the government asked for 500 of their men to help fight their battle with Mexico. Joining the U.S. Army and fighting a war for the politicians after what they had done to them was like putting salt on a fresh wound. The soldiers would have to leave their wives and children to fend for themselves in the dead of winter. Although this seemed a bitter pill to swallow, Brigham Young said he could see the overall picture and did all he could to muster out the requested number of men. He said he must raise the battalion but that he would outgeneral the men in Washington. It was a strange remark, but eventually it proved his capabilities as a prophet and seer. Captain Allen, the U.S. commander of the battalion, said he would not blame the Mormons if they did not volunteer, and he admitted that if he were in their place, he would not volunteer because of how they had been treated in the past. It did prove to be an unusually great sacrifice. Many questions have been raised concerning this great event in American history. Yet both Americans and Mormons alike seem to know very little about it. This chapter will present several questions and answers that should provide a more complete picture. The answers are given by church leaders who themselves had played a personal role in that difficult part of Mormon history. 1. What sacrifices did members of the battalion make when they answered the call to go to war with Mexico? Many of the battalion boys are here today, who walked over the plains and deserts. They know what they have endured. They left their fathers, mothers, and children on the prairie, and some of them they have never since seen, and will not in this time, for they sleep in the silent grave. They suffered all this in fighting for the country that had cast them out. Brigham Young, J.D. 2 186. 2. How difficult was this battalion march to Mexico? Our battalion went to the scene of action, not in easy berths on steamboats, nor with few months' absence but on foot over 2,000 miles across trackless deserts and barren plains, experiencing every degree of privation, hardship, and suffering during some two years' absence before they could rejoin their families. Brigham Young, J.D. 2 174. 3. How far did the Mormon Battalion march? The patient, heroic endurance of the Mormon Battalion, while making their wondrous march of 2,030 miles, the planting of the stars and stripes on these mountains and in these valleys, then Mexican soil by their fathers, brothers, sisters and wives, are historical facts, and so are the circumstances under which these things were done, historical facts establishing love for, and loyalty to our country that no honest man can ever question. Moses Thatcher, J.D. 23-210. 4. What conditions existed between the American government and the Mormon people, leading up to the calling of the Mormon battalion? Permit me to draw your attention for a moment, to a few facts in relation to raising the battalion for the Mexican War. When the storm cloud of persecution lowered down upon us on every side, when every avenue was closed against us, our leaders treacherously betrayed and slain by the authorities of the government, in which we lived and no hope of relief, could penetrate through the thick darkness and gloom which surrounded us on every side, no voice was raised in our behalf, and the general government was silent to our appeals. When we had been insulted and abused all the day long, by those in authority requiring us to give up our arms, and by every other act of insult and abuse, which the prolific imagination of our enemies could devise to test, as they said, our patriotism, which requisitions, be it known, were always complied with on our part, and when we were finally compelled to flee, for the preservation of our lives and the lives of our wives and children, to the wilderness, I ask, had we not reason to feel that our enemies were in the ascendant? That even the government, by their silent acquiescence, were also in favor of our destruction? Had we not, I ask, some reason to consider them all, 
both the people and the government alike, are enemies, and when in addition to all this, and while fleeing from our enemies, another test of fidelity and patriotism, was contrived by them for our destruction, and acquiesced in by the government, through the agency of a distinguished politician who evidently sought, and thought he had planned, our overthrow and total annihilation consisting of a requisition from the War Department, to furnish a battalion of 500 men to fight under their officers, and for them, in the war then existing with Mexico, I ask again, could we refrain from considering both people and government? Our most deadly foes, look a moment at our situation, and the circumstances under which this requisition was made. We were migrating, we knew not whither, except that it was our intention to go beyond the reach of our enemies. We had no homes, save our wagons and tents, and no stores of provisions and clothing, but had to earn our daily bread, by leaving our families in isolated locations for safety, and going among our enemies to labor. Were we not, even before this cruel requisition was made, unmercifully borne down by oppression and persecution past endurance by any other community? But under these trying circumstances we were required to turn out of our traveling camps 500 of our most efficient men, leaving the old, the young, the women upon the hands of the residue, to take care of and support, and in case we refused to comply with so unreasonable a requirement, we were to be deemed enemies to the government, and fit only for the slaughter. Brigham Young, J.D. 2 173-174. 5. What promise did God make to the members of the Mormon battalion? But God, in his providence, did not place us in a position to embrew our hands in the blood of our fellowmen. And when 500 men after we were driven from Illinois in 1846 were required to make up the Mormon battalion for the Mexican War, the promise of God to these 500 men was that they should not be compelled to shed blood during their absence. And in a remarkable manner this prediction was fulfilled. They never shrank from doing their duty as good, loyal citizens and soldiers. But there was no bloodshedding by the Mormon battalion. George Q. Cannon, J.D. 22328. 6. What blessings did God give to the Mormons for responding to this call? When the South raised the flag of rebellion, there was no well-informed Latter-day Saint who could approve in his heart of such conduct. However much we might have expected it, Joseph Smith having predicted, nearly thirty years before the rebellion broke out, that it would occur however much this might be the case there was nothing connected with the principle of secession or rebellion that met with the approval of the Latter-day Saints. And it is a remarkable fact that God, through the acts of our enemies, caused us to be placed in a position where, in the war of the rebellion, we should not be compelled to shed the blood of our fellow men. Had we remained in New York, where our people first settled or afterwards in Ohio, had we remained in Missouri, to which state we subsequently emigrated and from whence we were cruelly driven, had we remained in Illinois, where we afterwards took refuge, and from whence we were also cruelly driven to the wilderness, we should have been made participants in that dreadful strife. We should have been compelled to have taken up the weapons of war, or the people would have said we were disloyal. An action at such a time would have been set down to disloyalty and sympathy with the rebellion, and we could scarcely have escaped, in view of the prejudices against us, being branded and treated as traitors to the government. But we were here in the mountains, in a position where we could do nothing in the strife. George Q. Cannon, J.D. 22 327-328 well, suppose a man had stood up and prophesied before the battalion went to California, or when we were first driven out from Illinois, that we should ever be prospered, clothed and fed, until we could come here into these mountains and raise food for our own sustenance. Who would have believed it? Parley P. Pratt, J.D. 3 310. I have seen the time when our brethren have had to eat beef hides wolves, dogs and skunks, you may smile, but I can tell you that it was no laughing matter at that time, for there were many who could not get even dogs to eat. Many of the brethren in those trying times were clothed in skins of wild animals. I felt impressed to prophesy to them, and I said, never mind, boys, in less than one year there will be plenty of clothes and everything that we shall want sold at less than St. Louis prices, and I thought when I came to reflect upon it, that it was a very improbable thing, and Brother Rich told me that he thought I had done up the job at prophesying that time. But the sequel showed the prediction to be of the Lord. In less than six months, the emigration to California came through here laden down with good clothing, bacon, flour, groceries and everything we wanted. The opening of the gold mines had caused them to rush for the scene of excitement. They came with their trunks full of the best of clothing, and they opened them and turned out a great deal of the clothing, and the brethren and sisters bought good coats, 
vests, shawls, and dresses at a mere nominal price, and in this way the Lord supplied our wants, and he will do so again if the circumstances ever require it. This is the God that I believe in, and in him I put my trust. I know also that he will fight our battles from this time henceforth, if we will only do right. He will turn our enemies aside and cause all things to work together for our good. Therefore, let us trust in him, and he will send his angels to watch over us, and he will preserve us as in the hollow of his hand. Heber C. Kimball, J. D. 10 247. 7. What happened to those family members who were left behind at winter quarters? The families of the volunteers who formed the battalion, being thus left without protectors, entailed much additional responsibility and labor upon those left behind, and rendered it impossible for the companies to proceed to the Rocky Mountains that season. They encamped at Winter Quarters, the place now called Florence, in the Omaha country, where they built 700 log cabins and 150 caves or dugouts, in which a great number of the people resided through the winter. Some 2,000 wagons were scattered about in the Potawatomi country, on the east side of the Missouri. Dot, 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 George A. Smith, J.D. 1382 8. Why did the U.S. government approve of Senator Benton's plan to enlist Mormons in a military battalion? The plan of raising a battalion to march to California by a call from the War Department was devised with a view to the total overthrow of this kingdom and the destruction of every man, woman and child, and was hatched up by Senator Thomas H. Benton. Every day our progress was reported in Washington. Our enemies firmly believed we would refuse to respond to the call, and they told President Polk this would prove to him whether we were friends to the Union, and they further advised Polk when the call would be rejected, to say to the states of Missouri and Illinois and the Mobocrats, the Mormons are at your mercy. Brigham Young, Manuscript History of Brigham Young, 1847-1850, page 124. 9. How serious were the plans to destroy all the Mormons' men, women and children? Dot, 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 as our forefathers fought under General Washington and saved the country from the enemy, so did this Mormon battalion save a large tract of land from being taken by the enemy, and they saved this people from being pounced upon by the militia of several states, for heartless villains had concocted plans to have all this people murdered while upon the western frontiers. You will all remember that I went to Washington, and I know from what I there learned, that the Han, Thomas H. Benton advocated the necessity of raising troops and cutting off all the backquote, M-O-R-M-O-N-S apostrophe from the face of the earth. Notwithstanding you had rendered your services, and offered your names to go and serve your country in the war with Mexico. Yet, while you were doing this, one of the senators, and one of the principal men in the Senate, too, did endeavor to induce the Senate, the cabinet, and the House of Representatives, to raise a force sufficiently strong to go out against the poor defenseless backquote, M-O-R-M-O-N apostrophe women and children who were left upon the wild prairie unprotected. Yes, Mr. Those, H. Benton wanted to take troops and pounce upon your wives and children, when upon the banks of the Missouri River, and sweep them out of existence. And when the case was argued, the question was asked, backquote, S U P P O S I N G U cut off the men, what shall be done with the women and children? Backquote, O said Benton backquote, I, F you argue the case, and wish to know what shall be done with the women, I say wipe them off too. Backquote, W E L L then he was asked backquote, W H A T shall be done with the children? Backquote, W H Y said Benton backquote. C, U, T, them off, men, women and children, for the earth ought to drink their blood, and the feeling was so strong upon the question, that it came within a little of magnetizing the whole nation. Yes, brethren, had it not been for this battalion, a horrible massacre would have taken place upon the banks of the Missouri River. Brigham Young, Concise History of the Mormon Battalion, Dan Tyler, page 349. Suppose it had been shown to you that there were men in Washington, and influential, too, men who held control of the affairs of the nation, to a great degree, who had plotted to massacre this people, while on the frontiers in an Indian country, you would doubtless have gone to work to circumvent their plans, consequently, all we had to do was to beat them at their own game, which we did most successfully. I was and am fully persuaded that a senator from Missouri did actually apply for, and received permission from President Polk to call upon the militia of Iowa, Illinois and Missouri, and if he wished more, he had also authority to go to Kentucky and raise a force strong enough to wipe this people out of existence. 
provided that those men who had been driven from their homes should refuse to comply with the unjust demand upon us for troops. This circumstance you are all well acquainted with, and I need not speak more about it. I bid. P-352. 10. Was President Polk aware of this conspiracy to destroy the Mormon people? Captain Allen did not inform the people for the reason, probably, that he knew nothing about it what the design was in case the battalion was not raised. The secret history of the transaction is, as President Young was afterwards informed on the best of authority, that Thomas H. Benton, United States Senator from the state of Missouri, got a pledge from President Polk, that if the Mormons did not raise the battalion of 500, he might have the privilege of raising volunteers in the upper counties of Missouri, to fall upon them and use them up. George Q. Cannon, Ibid, page 117, 11. Did anyone in government position come to the defense of the Mormon people at this time? I will briefly allude to Colonel Donovan. After his return, and in a party made by his friends, in St. Louis, at which Mr. Benton was present, he made a speech, and in his remarks, said, I can take 1,000 Mormon boys, and do more efficient service against Mexico, than you can with the whole American army. This I have been told by those who heard him make the assertion. That was his testimony, and I presume he gave it openly and publicly. I suppose he felt like giving Benton a challenge, for he was always opposed to him in politics, but Benton was not disposed to say anything in reply to it. At least I have heard of no reply. Brigham Young, I bid, page 353. 12. How did the U.S. military officers feel toward members of the Mormon battalion, after getting to know them? Captain Allen said to me, using his own words, I have fallen in love with your people. I love them as I never loved a people before. He was a friend to the uttermost. When he had marched that Mormon battalion as far as Fort Leavenworth, he was thrown upon a sickbed where I then believed, and do now. He was nursed, taken care of, and doctored to the silent tomb, and the battalion went on with God for their friend. That battalion took up their line of march from Fort Leavenworth by way of Santa Fe, and over a desert and dreary route, and planted themselves in the lower part of California, to the joy of all the officers and men that were loyal. At the time of their arrival, General Kearney was in a straightened position, and Colonel P. St. George Cook promptly marched the battalion to his relief, and said to him, We have the boys here now that can put all things right. The boys in that battalion performed their duty faithfully. I never think of that little company of men without the next thoughts being, God bless them forever and forever. Brigham Young, J.D. 10 106. 13. Were the U.S. government actions constitutional? After talking about the Mormon battalion very different are these sentiments from those uttered not many years since by a prominent Republican leader in the House of Representatives, who, when asked if he, as a lawyer, would state to the House that the measure introduced by him, and then under consideration by it, was in its provisions in harmony with the Constitution, answered with a sneer, why any justice of the peace would tell the gentleman it is not constitutional but it is a measure we want and one we shall pass, and by the time its constitutionality is tested, it will have accomplished the object we have in view. Moses Thatcher, J.D. 23-211. 14. Did the attitude of the government change toward the Mormons after the march of the Mormon battalion? I have looked upon scenes that are calculated to stir up the stoutest heart, without shedding a tear, but I cannot look upon the procession of this day July 24th, 1852, and consider the blessings that now surround this people, without shedding tears of gratitude, that God has so kindly delivered us out of all our distresses, and given to us our liberty. To be sure, after working our way into these valleys, making the roads through mountains, seeking out the route, and coming here, our persecutions did not cease, our enemies were like the good old Quaker, when he turned the dog out of doors, said he, I won't kill thee. Thou hast got out of my reach, I cannot kill thee, but I will give thee a bad name, and he hallowed out bad dog and somebody, supposing the dog to be mad, shot him. So with us, after robbing us of millions of property, and driving us cruelly from the land of our birth, after violating every solitary law of the government, in which many of the officers were partakers, expelling us into the wilderness, where they thought we would actually perish, and there is not to be found in the history of the world. A parallel case of suffering that this people endured, while in the midst of this, the cry of mad dog was raised to finish, as they thought, the work of destruction and murder. George A. Smith, J.D. 143-44. 15. What role did battalion members play in the formation of civil government in the West? In 1847 the standard of the American nation was planted on this temple block. I assisted in planting it, and many around me today participated in those early scenes. At the same time the country lying west of the Sierra Nevada and between it and the Pacific coast, 
was held under the American flag by the Mormon Battalion, who under General Kearney captured the state of California from the Mexican government and held it for the United States government until this country was ceded to the United States by treaty on the 22nd of February, 1848. The Stars and Stripes were planted between the Rocky Mountains on the east and the Sierra Nevadas west by Mormon colonies and west to the Pacific coast by the Mormon Battalion and the country held for the American government. We proceeded to the establishment and organization of civil government. This great basin country between the mountains was incorporated into the state of Deseret. A provisional government was organized for the state of Deseret. A republican constitution was framed and adopted by the people. The country was divided into counties and precincts. Local government was organized, laws adopted, and delegates set to Congress to ask for admission into the Union. Aristus Snow JD 2386-87. 16. What was the story about some Mormon battalion members discovering gold? At the same time the gold hunters were flocking to California. After the Mormon battalion revealed the first gold which they brought to light, while dragging Captain Sutter's mill race. Some of the men are still in our midst who brought about these results, who first revealed to the astonished world the gold of California, and who raised the first Fuhrer, which resulted in thousands flocking to the Pacific coast. Aristus Snow. JD 2387. 17. What effect did the discovery of gold by battalion members in California have on the saints in Deseret? We had anticipated, when we came into these distant valleys, that we should be entirely secluded from the world that we should trouble no person, and that no person would trouble us. The Mormon battalion had been disbanded in California, and some of that body first discovered gold there. The news of that discovery quickly reached the eastern states, and thousands were soon upon our track. Instead of being secluded, we find ourselves in the great national highway. We must be known, and we could not be in a better situation to be known than where we are. Brigham Young, JD 10 229 230. 18. What else was accomplished by members of the Mormon Battalion? And, mark you, the first colony of settlers upon that Pacific coast, after the capture of that country through the valor of the Mormon Battalion, was a Mormon colony shipped from the New England states who took with them a printing press, and planted their feet upon the shores of San Francisco, and there issued the California Star, in 1847, which was the first publication in the English language west of the Rocky Mountains the first free press, hailing the American flag and proclaiming American liberty, the principles of free government, and at the same time we planted a free press in the city, whence was issued the Deseret News, proclaiming those principles to all the world. Aristus Snow, J.D. 2387 19. What were the reactions of the Mormon battalion members and their families toward the U.S. government after the battalion march? 500 men, the strength of Israel, were sent to fight the battles of their country, leaving their wives, children and teams on the prairie. They had to exercise faith, and so had we who remained, believing it would turn out for the best, and it has proved so. Every member of that battalion who has remained faithful has always rejoiced, from that day to this, that he was a member thereof. It has proved a blessing to him, and it proved salvation to Zion. Wilford Woodruff, J.D. 13 160. After all this, to prove our loyalty to the Constitution and not to their infernal meanness, we went to fight the battles of a free country, to give it power and influence, and to extend our happy institutions in other parts of this widely extended republic. In this way we have proved our loyalty. We have done everything that has been required of us. Can there anything reasonable and constitutional be asked that we would not perform? No. Brigham Young, J.D. 10 107. 20. Would any other people in America have responded with a battalion as did the Mormons after the treatment they had received? I will again urge upon this people to so live that they will have the knowledge they desire, as we have knowledge not of all, but only of that which is necessary. Have we not shown to the world that we love the constitution of our country and its institutions, better than do those who have been and are now distracting the nation? You cannot find a community, placed under the circumstances that we were, that would have done as we did on the occasion of furnishing the Mormon battalion, after our leading men had been slain, and we had been compelled to leave our farms, gardens, homes and firesides, while, at the same time, the general government was called upon in vain to put a stop to such a series of abuses against an innocent people. Brigham Young, J.D. 10 107. Even though the wicked plans to destroy the Mormons and their kingdom of God failed at this time, the Prince of Darkness continued his efforts to destroy Mormonism. His next major effort came about ten years after their arrival in the valley.